Let's pray. Jesus, we are grateful today that we have you in our lives. Thank you for music. Thank you for praise and worship. And Lord, as we open your word, thank you for teaching us, we pray. Amen. So we started a series in the book of Mark. We spent one Sabbath looking at John Mark and his life, failures and successes and redemption. And then the next week we got sidetracked into Malachi because remember Mark jumps straight into the story, whereas Matthew takes a couple of chapters to get into uh, um, Jesus' ministry, actually about three. Uh, Luke takes even longer. Mark's into it by about verse 11 of the first chapter. And he starts out that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and jumps right into John the Baptist. And he's the only one, look in Mark chapter 1 just for a moment here, he's the only one who quotes the Malachi passage that we find there in verse 2, Behold, I send my messenger before your face to prepare your way before you. Then all the Gospels quote the next verse, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, which is from Isaiah chapter 40. So that got us off to the book of Malachi, which caused me to probably do the first attempt to explain the book of Malachi that I have in my ministry. And uh, remember, I, I boiled the book of Malachi down to, uh, you, you guys are really sh like not ready for the Messiah to come. Um, you have a hundred years after the return from Babylon, things aren't going well for the Jewish people. They're kind of in a downtime. They've been oppressed. And Daniel had talked about the coming of Messiah 100 years before. And so they're looking for the Messiah to come and solve all their woes. When Messiah comes, everything's going to be good. The problem is what Malachi says is you're not even following the law of Moses. You're not even following what God says. You're offering um, blemish sacrifices uh, that cost you nothing. You're, you priests are divorcing your wives for a younger model from over the hill. Um, uh, you're misappropriating the temple funds. And if Messiah shows up, he's going to come in like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. You are going to get smelted out and washed out. But those who fear my name, notice relationship words now, their names are going to be in the book. And that's what Revelation calls the book of life. And they will shine like jewels with me when I come. So they will be smelted pure, whereas the dross will be smelted out. And then Malachi ends with, remember the law of Moses, remember what I've already given you, and I'm going to send Elijah before the coming of that great and dreadful day, because God doesn't want to lose people, he wants to save people, right? So if we're not ready, he sends a warning, he sends a message, he sends a preparation. And so we went over to the Gospels. The angel Gabriel shows up to Zechariah, the old priest in the temple, never had any children, and says, you're going to have a son, and he's going to go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And that means he's going to go before Messiah. Just before Messiah comes, Elijah will return to prepare the hearts of the people, Malachi says. And the angel says, your son John is going to be that forerunner of Messiah. So John is born. John grows up. John is preaching out in the wilderness. The book of John tells the story of how the Pharisees came down and said to him, Are you Elijah? Basically, they came down to say, Who authorized you to do what you're doing? And as I suggested, we seem to be all caught up as human beings trying to make sure everybody's authorized. You know, God can do his own authorizing, can't he? So who's authorized you? Are you Elijah? And he says, no. Now, wait a minute. The angel said he's going to go out in the spirit and power of Elijah. But when they ask him if you're Elijah, he says, no. So is Elijah or is he not Elijah? And the answer is yes. He's not literal Elijah. That was the thing that they'd started looking for. They, they took Malachi and said, it's going to be literal Elijah. He went up in a chariot of fire. He's going to come back down. It's really going to be him. So when they asked John, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not Elijah. You know, I'm John the Baptist. I'm not Elijah. 
But when Jesus had messengers sent to him after John was put in prison to ask him, are you really the one? Because remember, Messiah is supposed to set the captives free, but the forerunner, John the Baptist, was sitting in a dungeon. Why wasn't he setting him free? So John the Baptist finally gets a little discouraged and says, send some messengers. Are you really him? Are you really the coming one? Or do we look for still another? And Jesus healed the sick and and uh, you know cleansed the lepers and did whatever he did that day in miracles. And then he sent them back and said, tell them what you see. The poor have the gospel preached to them. You know, the, the sick are healed. Uh, the lame are walking. The blind are seeing. The deaf are hearing. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Have you ever discovered that God does not necessarily do what you want him to do? And we get offended. God, I prayed, and, why, and you didn't do what I asked. You know what? We want to get a hold of God, but God wants to get a hold of you. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. He doesn't need to be gotten a hold of. He's got his act together. We're the ones that need to be gotten a hold of. And he doesn't always do what we ask. But if we put our lives in his hands, we will see in the end that he does what's good. We have to trust, not instruct. You know, our idea of trusting God is instructing him. You do this, 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 and this, and I trust you're going to do what I say. No, 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 no. I put my life in your hands. This is what I'd like, but I trust you to do what you know is best. So blessed is he who's not offended in me. And then Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, by the way, that's John. If you're willing to accept it, that's, I mean, that's Elijah, I'm sorry. That's Elijah, the one that is to come. So Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah and he's the forerunner. Then he takes his disciples up on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, and they sleep through most of a glorious event. They get in on the last few moments when they wake up. Elijah and Moses do actually show up in person. And so that gets the disciples thinking, you see. They just saw Elijah, and didn't Malachi say Elijah was going to come? And didn't the Pharisees say that Elijah would come first? And they'd probably been arguing that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because Elijah hadn't shown up. And so on the way down the mountain, they're talking about this. And Jesus says Elijah does come first and has come. And if you can receive it, John the Baptist was Elijah. So Malachi was fulfilled. God sent someone to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus. The problem is Jesus was still rejected. And I've had people question me on this, but I'm going to stick with it. I do not believe Israel was predestined to reject their Messiah. There are lots of prophecies that would show what would happen if they'd accepted him. And all the prophecies that predict his rejection were sealed until after the event. Book of Daniel, sealed prophecies. Which tell us God did, that the God's favorite thing would have been to have those sealed prophecies never unsealed and never fulfilled. That his Messiah would have been received and Jesus would have died as a sacrifice, not as a murder victim. He would have raised, he would have reigned. And you've got lots of Old Testament prophecies that talk about the nation saying, come, let's go up to the house of the Lord. And other nations coming say, let's go attack them. And those who come and join will become part of God's great kingdom. And those who come to attack will beat themselves to death against the impregnable wall of God and his protection. Until, at some point, everyone's either joined or wiped themselves out. And the world becomes the kingdom of God. That appears to be the scenario God wanted, even though God knew it wasn't going to happen. But he gave prophecies ahead of time that were sealed so that after the fact we can realize God didn't lose control. But he doesn't predestine our failures, even though he pre-knows them. And that's one of those impossible things to figure out. How can God pre-know and not predetermine? And you just have to give up and bow before the infinite. All right? From that logic... Jesus says, now I'm going to have to go and I will come again. Is there another Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord's second coming? And that's where we went to the book of Revelation. And we see that chapter 11 picks up Elijah and Moses, just like the last of, of Malachi. Remember the law of Moses and I will send Elijah. 
So in chapter 11, you have the two witnesses. One can stop the rain, Elijah, and one turns water to blood and brings plagues, Moses, not named, but inferred. And then you have in the sixth plague, the battle of Armageddon, which is not a battle fought in a valley because Armageddon is Har Mageddon, and Har is not valley in Hebrew. Har is mountain. It's a battle on a mountain. And the mountain of Megiddo happens to be called Mount Carmel, which takes us back to Elijah standing on the mountain saying, make up your mind, it's decision time, who are you going to serve? The gods of this world or the God who made the world? Which one? Make up your mind because it's decision time. So that was what we spent three weeks. See now, if I'd have had that down ahead of time, I could have done it in 10 minutes. But um, that took three weeks for us to figure out and see that you have the original Elijah, you have John the Baptist, who's the Elijah message before the first coming of Messiah, which God hoped would be the only coming of Messiah, but in that he was rejected, we now have another Elijah message calling the world, getting them ready for the second coming of the Lord. And we kind of closed that third three weeks ago with the question, who is that last Elijah? What is that last Elijah's message and what does that have to do with us? So, having gotten that far, now today we're going to back up and we're going to look at the life of Elijah. So if we want to figure out what the Elijah is all about, we better figure out what Elijah is about. Does that make sense? So go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. This will probably take us several weeks, but we're going to look at the life of Elijah. Elijah has about six chapters devoted to him and his story. Elijah was considered by the Jewish people to be the greatest of the prophets, even though he never wrote a book. Why do you think they might consider him to be the greatest of the prophets? He's the only one God took up in a chariot of fire. That kind of puts you apart in a special group, right? A group of one. And his compatriot, of course, is Enoch, who appears to have never died. It says God took him. It says Enoch walked with God, and as the old preacher said, they were walking along, and one day God said, you're closer to my house than yours, why don't you come on over? And Enoch disappeared. He was not, because God took him. So there appear to be two people up there who never died which represents those of us, hopefully I can say us, who are alive when Jesus comes and are translated without seeing death. Moses appears to have gotten an early resurrection. He died and the angels buried him and nobody knew where his grave was or they'd have made a shrine out of it. But then the book of Jude talks about a dispute over the body of Moses. We believe in a bodily resurrection. God does not dispute over dead bodies. He doesn't want a corpse. And then Moses shows up on the mountain of transfiguration which fits our model as Seventh-day Adventists. We believe when you die, you're dead until the resurrection. So the saints are, aren't, aren't all in heaven and the sinners aren't all in hell. Everybody's asleep until Jesus comes. But Moses got an early resurrection. He represents those who will be raised at the second coming. And Elijah represents those that will be translated. And Moses and Elijah come down to encourage Jesus just be, as he's facing the crucifixion there on the Mount of Transfiguration. They come down to encourage him. Why would they want to encourage Jesus? <laughs> well, first of all, it's a love story, right? There's a lot of love in heaven. Of course, we encourage each other. But if Jesus doesn't go to the crucifixion, they don't get to stay. Because they're not in heaven on their merits. They're in, in heaven on, on the presupposed merits of the Messiah. So they want him to succeed. Or they have to leave town so to speak. So uh, anyway, Elijah, who was translated, is considered to be the greatest of the prophets, and his story starts in 1 Kings chapter 17. We don't get any backstory on Elijah. Turn there in your Bibles. I'm not putting anything on the screen today. You're going to have to actually read your Bible. 
Chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. That is the introduction to Elijah. That's about as abrupt as the Gospel of Mark, right? Boom, we're there. So who was Elijah? Well, he was a Tishbite. Well, Tishba was um, a little town. If you look at a map and you have the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, Jerusalem's on this side and Samaria and most of Israel, but on the other side up opposite the Sea of Galilee and just south of there is the land of Gilead. And uh, Elijah was from Gilead. So he traverses several days' journey and shows up in uh, probably Jezreel, uh, where the king had his uh, palace. He shows up without an invitation, without an announcement, without an audience having been granted, and he simply walks into the king and says, it's not going to rain anymore until I say so. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do. I mean, I could go say that, and it wouldn't mean diddly, right? Well, in, in Arizona, it might actually work for a while, right? I would have liked to have said that up in western Washington a week ago. It's not going to rain anymore till I leave, because it did nothing but rain. All but one of ten days. So let's try to look at the backstory a little bit here. We have to back up to chapter 16. There have been a series of revolutions in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam's son only reigned, uh, Nadab only reigned two years, and Basha killed him, took over the throne. And Basha reigned about two decades, and he died. He was evil, worshipped idols, as Jeroboam had. And Elah, his son, took over, and when Elah had been on the throne about two years, Zimri killed him. And when Zimri had been ruling for, oh, let's see, when Basha came to the throne, he killed every relative and friend of Jeroboam. When Zimri killed Basha's son, he killed every family member and friend of Basha. This is a family genocide. But Zimri only lasted seven days, and Omri killed him. Well, Omri was made king by the people, the commander of the army, and he besieged the city where Zimri was. And when Zimri realized the city had been taken, he went into the king's house and burned it down on his head. So he checked out. And Omri reigned about a dozen years total, including the time of the revolution. So there's been revolution over the last few years. And there were about six years of peace, and Omri died, and a guy named Ahab came to the throne. Start in verse... 29, in the 30th year of Asa, that's the king down in Judah. That's how the chronology is kept, one king against the other. Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned in Samaria for 22 years. He reigned in Samaria. That was the region, not just the town. But it appears he had his palace in Jezreel to the north end of the country. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Nadab his son did evil, and Basha who killed Nadab did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Elah, Basha's son, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Zimri did evil in the sight of the Lord, and Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, but Ahab did, in the, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all that were before him. So we have a new regime that reaches new lows. And it tells us what he did. Verse 31, it came to pass as... Though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, what were the sins of Jeroboam? Do you remember that story? When Solomon died and Rehoboam, there's all these Boams, you've got to figure this out. Say, when Solomon died and Rehoboam, his son, took the kingdom, the northern tribes, the southern tribes were Judah and Benjamin was kind of within Judah. And then there were the northern ten tribes. They came down to Rehoboam and said, your dad's had, his taxes were too high. 
His labor demands were too high. I know we built the temple, but man, we're tired. Loosen up a little bit. And Rehoboam went to the old men. Rehoboam was a young man. He went to the old men, the counselors of his father Solomon, and said, what do you counsel? And they said, treat them well, they'll serve you for life. He went to the young men, his cohorts, and said, what do I say? And they said, you got to keep them in control. And he listened to the young men. And when they came back, he said, my little finger is thicker than my father's arm. You ain't seen nothing yet. My dad taxed you, I'll tax you more. My dad worked you, I'll work you more. And the northern kingdom said, goodbye. Knock yourself out. We're out of here. And they split the kingdom in two, and Jeroboam became the king in the north. Jeroboam said, now let's see, if they keep going down to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, they'll finally get reconciled and go home. And I'll lose my kingdom. So he said, we need to have our own worship system up here. And so he resurrected the golden calf. You got to go clear back to Mount Sinai. This is your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember that? They said that when they built the golden calf. And so Jeroboam picked up the golden calf thing and he made a golden calf that he put in the south territory and another golden calf that he put in the north territory. And he said, Israel, these are your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he resurrects the golden calf cult, so to speak. And the people all turn to idols and turn from God. That was the sin of Jeroboam, that his son and then Basha and his son and then Zimri for seven days, and then Omri perpetuated was the idolatrous worship of the golden calves. But when Ahab came along, golden calves weren't enough for him. Verse 31, came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the golden calf cult, that he took as wife Jezebel. I was trying to think, I've never known a family to name their daughter Jezebel. It just doesn't seem to have happened. That name got ruined right here. I don't even know what it means. It's probably a, it probably has a great meaning. I don't know. But he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Baal means Lord. So when you talk about worshiping Baal in a minute, it's simply worshiping the lords. Ethbaal is not a god. Ethbaal was the king of Sidon. So he took Jezebel, the son of the king of Sidon. Now Sidon, if you get your map out again in your mind, and you've got the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, and Samaria's over here, and Sidon's just up here, maybe 50 miles to the left over on the seacoast. So it's a fairly neighboring kingdom. It's the kingdom just to the north and west. He took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he added to the golden calf cults, he added the Baal cults. And he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So he built a temple, and he set up an altar, and he made a wooden image, and that, we can key that word back to an Asherah, which was the fertility goddess of the Canaanites, which God specifically told them to throw out when they moved into the land of Canaan. So he starts two new cults, the cult of Baal, or Lord, and the cult of Asherah, the fertility goddess. And he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now just skip verse 34, it's kind of a side trip. So what you have going on when Elijah shows up, is the government has just embraced a number of new anti-God regulations, so to speak. Now, they're in the area of worship, 
And of course, every preacher in every generation can get up and say, that must be just like now because the government's going downhill. And they still are. So I'm not trying to pull out the newspaper and say, this is it. But I have to say, if you look at our history for the last 20 years, we have institutionalized new lows, anti-God. So maybe we can kind of picture ourselves there. You know, every generation thinks this is as bad as it can get. Jesus must be coming soon. And my grandpa preached it, and, you know, my dad preached it, and I'm preaching it, and I'm in my 60s. And some people say, how can you keep preaching Jesus is coming soon when he doesn't show up? Because his timing's different than mine. But I believe the prophecies are clear, and I believe Jesus is coming soon, even if that's soon after I'm gone. Okay, But I think we can kind of look at our world today and say, yeah, I think Ahab took over the government recently. <laughs> and we have several new anti-God things that have been institutionalized against the ways of God in our own world or country. So just think of it this way. Israel has reached significant new lows in the very recent years under Ahab when Elijah shows up. Now there's one other piece of backstory on Elijah that I hadn't really seen until meditating on it and reading some things this last week or two. Go to the book of James. Keep your place in 1 Kings, but go to the book of James if you, can, if you don't know where that is, find the book of Revelation and back up between five and ten pages. You'll find the book of James. But be careful, it's only about five pages long, so you can miss it. In the book of James, yeah, right after Hebrews, in the book of James chapter 5, when it's talking about anointing the sick and praying for healing, James makes an illustration and his illustration is of Elijah, and it's meant to say God doesn't have the year of Elijah any more than he has the year of you. What he seems to be saying here is if you need to pray for healing, you don't need to find a celebrity prayer. You don't need to, you know, I've, I've been saying, what are we going to do? Billy Graham's dead. You know, he's not here to pray for us anymore. You know, everybody thinks if we can get some big name to pray for us, you know, you're, you're sick, so you call some radio or TV preacher. I believe you'll get the most results if you just find some dear little old lady or man in the church that really knows how to talk to God and have them pray for you. God does not into celebrities. And that seems to be what the point is that James is saying here. If you look in chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. He seems to suggest that Elijah is just a normal human being who prayed, and God responded. So you're a normal human being, and you can pray, and God will respond, okay? But we get a little tiny bit of backstory here on Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and what's the next phrase? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now what that tells us is that in chapter 17, verse 1 of 1 Kings, when Elijah the Tishbite of Gilead shows up in Ahab's palace and says, The Lord God of Israel says, before whom I stand, there will not be dew nor rain these years except of my word. The Elijah had been back in Gilead praying earnestly that God would do something to interrupt the, the slide in the degradation of his country. Do you follow that? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. So it appears that it's Elijah, who must have been a man who over his life developed a close walk with God in the midst of idolatry, the, all of the uh, um, golden calf cults. He's living in that milieu. And then as he's growing up, Ahab shows up and he brings in Baal worship. And by the way, Baal was supposed to be the Lord of heaven and earth. That's why he was called Baal, which means Lord. 
which means Baal, Baal, we'll just go back to the way we say it, otherwise it sounds like we're a calf or something, Baal. Um, so Baal is in charge of the rain and other natural phenomena. So Elijah, according to James, is a man who went to earnest prayer that God would act on behalf of his people against the corruption that was growing by leaps and bounds at that very time. I want you to notice, Elijah was not a man who went out on the street corner and railed at people for their sins. He didn't get on the radio and have a talk show about everything that's wrong with the government or people. He prayed earnestly that God would show up and cut off that false god at the knees. Knock him down. Turn the people around. End the cult of Baal. And he prayed earnestly. And what did he pray? That it would not rain. He prayed that God would neuter Baal. Right? The guy that's supposed to bring rain won't be able to bring rain. And if they're praying to the God that brings rain and no rain's coming, maybe they'll get the idea that he's not very powerful. And they ought to go to the one who can bring rain. So Elijah now, evidently he prays until God tells him, go talk to Ahab. Now he knows by showing up in Ahab's court without an invitation and with bad news, he could very easily be a martyr in a few moments. But Elijah is a gutsy man most of his life. The only time he caved was to Jezebel. <laughs> As my cousin said, when the, when the head of women's ministry came after him, he caved in. But anyway. Um, so the back story is the degradation of the country and Elijah praying. Not out slandering, not out yelling, not out protesting, not out starting a rebellion, not out getting a political petition going, but pray. And evidently praying that God will stop the rain to prove the impotence of Baal. So he shows up, chapter 17, verse 1, in the palace now. Evidently God says, okay, it's now time to go tell Ahab there's going to be no rain. Notice he says, as the Lord God, that's literally Yahweh or Yehovah Elohim. Yehovah, that's my preferred pronunciation. I preached on that seven or eight years ago. I'm sure you all remember. Um, most go with Yahweh. But that is, the, uh, that is the specific title of the God of creation, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Moses, of Mount Sinai. That's Yehovah. The word Elohim simply means God. So you have Baal Elohim is Baal God, or Yehovah Elohim is Yehovah God. Which God is God? See. So he shows up in the court and he says, as Yehovah, Elohim of Israel, as Yehovah, the God of Israel, Baal isn't the God of Israel, those calves aren't the God of Israel, the Asherah is not the goddess of Israel, but Yehovah is the God of Israel. So he, he stakes his claim in his very first sentence, as Yehovah, God of Israel, is alive. None of the other gods are alive, right? They're just wooden, metal, gold, or whatever images, which if they get knocked over, who has to set them back up? They're worshipers. Oh, our God fell over. We better set him back up. Remember when God poked fun at Dagon of the Philistines when the Philistines got the ark? 
Dagon ends up falling over on his face in front of the ark. <laughs> and the priests come in and their God fell over on his face in front of what they thought was the God of Israel, the ark. See, they have to set him back up. The next time he's fallen over, his hands are broken off. <laughs> God does have a sense of humor. As Yehovah, God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. I'm his man. I'm his messenger. He doesn't equivocate. He doesn't say if, and, or but. He says, Yehovah lives, and I stand before him. He didn't even say before you, king, whom I stand. I stand before God, Yehovah. There shall be neither dew nor rain these years except at my word. It's not going to be another drop of rain until I say so. Which means I am walking into your court, O king, and I am taking Baal hostage to the God of Israel. And he won't be able to emit one drop of rain <laughs> that he's supposed to be giving. Until my God says so. Your God just got neutered. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here. God speaking to Elijah. Go eastward and hide by the brook Cherith. You know, the brook Cherith flows right near Tishba. So that was, that, was, that was territory Elijah knew. He grew up there. Go to the brook Cherith that flows into the Jordan. It's a tributary that comes in from the east. And it will be that you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. So he was on the two meal a day plan. Just there you have it right in the Bible. Two meals a day. We could make a doctrine out of that here. And he drank from the brook and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then God has another plan. We're going to pick up the story there next week. So let's stop there today and just say... Do we live in a land that's reaching new lows? Yes. yes. And those lows are specifically, if you just read the book of Genesis, the first three chapters, we are in a nation and a world that is war with everything God originally made. He says he made us. The world says, no, you made yourself. He says he made them male and female. The world says, no, we don't recognize gender anymore. He brought them together in holy marriage. And the world says, now we're going to rewrite that. I should get out a slide I put up about five or six years ago. I had about 15 things pre-sin that you can see are being specifically attacked. We are in a world and in a nation that is attacking anything that God instituted and trying to replace it with our own stuff. So how, based on this story, should we respond? According to this story, we need to pray that God will show up and neuter the gods of this world And show his power. And stop the madness. It doesn't say to go out and rail against the sinners and tell them how bad they are. Elijah prayed until God told him what to do. And then he went and fearlessly did it. May I suggest we need to learn to pray. I still need to learn to pray. I've had some things happen this week around me that have caused me to feel an incredible need to pray. And when I try to pray, I run out of things to pray for in about 30 seconds. I have friends who can pray and pray and pray. And as they come to the end of their prayer, they kind of wind down and then they wind up again and then they wind down and then they wind up again, you know? 
You know how the the, uh, the symphonies end? You know, and and I, I just kind of run out of things to pray for. I need to learn to pray earnestly. How do we pray earnestly for things? I believe there's something about learning to come into God's presence in prayer that can make a difference, but it's usually a difference that's very different than the difference we want to make. We want to go out and tell somebody they're wrong and change something and do something. And all Elijah did was pray earnestly until the Lord said, go talk to Ahab and give him this message. And he went and gave the message. And it still took three and a half years, but things happened. And that kind of winds us into what is Elijah? What is his message? What is the timing of his message? And what might that have to do with us? To be continued. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that uh, we have some great stories in the Bible. They're fun, they're good, and they're instructive. Lord, we live at a time when we as Christians need to be active in promoting the kingdom of God in a world that does not want anything to do with the kingdom of God. But I'm afraid we go about it all wrong because we figure out what we need to do instead of seeing what you want done by waiting and praying earnestly. Would you teach us how to pray for our country? Would you teach us how to pray earnestly for your power and your kingdom to break through into the fallenness and the brokenness of the world around us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.